You're listening to episode 262A of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about your mysterious feedback on some of our recent episodes. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Let's get right into our feedback. Our first feedback comes from Justin, who sent in an email writing, Jimmy is indirectly responsible for my family's interest in UFOs. My seven-year-old son, Ted, drew this picture of an alien invasion as his fan art contribution. Regarding the note at the bottom, Ted left his picture unattended, and his younger sister drew a red X on the purple alien without his knowledge or permission. He wanted you to know that the red X was not part of the original picture. Okay, well, thank you very much. Ted has a very talented, and Ted is a very talented and imaginative artist, and I appreciate his fan art. He His depiction of the alien invasion features a large purple cat-like alien in the center, and it's also got a UFO on one side. It looks like some interesting emissions of some kind are coming out of the UFO. There's a couple of uh, little green-faced people, and there's a green entity that looks like a jellyfish and also some other stuff going on. And it does have a, a, a red X over the purple alien, and it says, ignore the X at the bottom. So I understand that. I've had little sisters, too. Um, <laughs> and it also has the phrase, it's always aliens. Because it is always aliens. All right. And we'll obviously have this. Uh, the, you can see the picture. If you're not watching the video, you can see the picture uh, of uh, his fan art on our website. We'll have it in the show notes. Right. So for these for uh, for these feedback episodes where people submit art and things like that, we'll have them at mysterious.fm slash the episode number. So this yes. would be mysterious.fm slash 262A. That's correct. All right, moving on to more feedback. Uh, James Tenney sent in an email and he says, regarding the Our Lady of Akita revelation and other approved private revelations, if the faithful are not bound to believe private revelations, how are we supposed to interact with them? If the events and prophecies are objectively true, wouldn't reason and our consciences dictate to us that we must assent to the truth claims? And if these prophecies are warning humanity of catastrophic events of the future, happening unless some prescribed action is taken and are recognized by the church to be true. It seems weird for the church to say at the same time, oh yeah, and you don't need to believe any of this, by the way. The reason that the church takes this approach is that the reality and accuracy of an apparition is not a matter of divine faith. Divine faith is part of public revelation, not private revelation. So what the church does is conduct an investigation and establish a probability, uh, depending on the strength. And, and, you know, interacting with probabilities in this area is the same as interacting with probabilities in other areas. Depending on the strength of the probability, it gives you more or less of a reason to believe, but it doesn't give you the certitude of divine faith. And so it's not binding on the faithful as a matter of divine faith. All right, then our next feedback comes from episode 244 on the Versailles time slip. And this one comes from Galaxy N32 on YouTube, who writes, uh, Father Michael Rodriguez's prophecies can still be true if we factor in some time slips. Not without changing history. Father Michel Rodriguez's uh, prophecies could not be true now that Pope Benedict has died and he died without being martyred and without trying to call an ecumenical council. So um, unless you change history to match the prophecies, they're just not true. Then Todd Jambon on YouTube writes, I can't believe you didn't Oh, present and I, I should say, I get that Galaxy in 32 is joking. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Todd Jambon on YouTube writes, I can't believe you didn't present aliens or demons as a possible explanation for this. It's always aliens or demons. What if the ladies had stumbled upon an alien base at Versailles and the aliens mentally projected something else to their heads so they wouldn't see the base? Well, hypothetically, there are an infinite number of explanations for every event and thus every mystery that occurs. What I'm trying to do is focus on the explanations that seem most likely, and that will vary depending on the nature of the mystery we're looking at. I don't want to mention aliens and demons every time because I don't want to include an is it aliens, is it demons segment in 
every single episode where I have to say no, no, and move on. Uh, Cameron Byers on YouTube writes, could this be similar to a remote viewing experience? When the women asked for directions, it reminded me of the remote viewer who asked the Soviet official for directions when he became lost during a session. Or the other remote viewer who traveled back in time and asked the bishop what city he was in. It could be that this was a shared psychic experience. Uh, specifically, it would be a retrocognitive one. And if so, then those exchanges might, where they're talking to people in the time slip, might have been similar to the extended remote viewing conversations that were reported by Major Bill Ray and Joe McMonagall, uh, who we discussed them in and their extended remote viewing, including conversations they had with people during it in episodes 190 and 191. However, this wouldn't appear to have been a remote viewing experience since they seem to be viewing Versailles where they were. It wasn't remote. They're standing in the middle of it. They were just seeing it as it was in the past, which would make this retrocognition, which is the opposite of precognition that would let you see the future. Melissa Palermo writes on YouTube, so when I heard you were going to cover this story, it sounded so fascinating that I went and watched other videos about it because I couldn't wait to learn about it. I heard one guy start with all the theories of what could have happened, but all along he kept saying they were just, quote, making it up for their book. Finally, at the end of his list was the theory that they just made it up, and he concluded that it was the only really plausible explanation. I love that you started the list of theories with the idea that they just made it up and explained why you thought that wasn't the case. The difference between how you explain things and how the other guy did is why your podcast is exceptional. Well, thank you very much. I try to be fair minded and not go into a mystery with assumptions about what it must be. Um, I also consider natural explanations like hoaxes first before considering paranormal ones. And then the cheese pizza guy on YouTube writes, good episode as always. Maybe I'm in the minority here, but I don't usually weigh the lack of a clear motive for a hoax as particularly strong evidence. I think sometimes people make up hoaxes for their own amusement or for unknown reasons. However, this instance doesn't seem like a hoax. Yeah, I agree that this one doesn't seem like a hoax. However, it can be difficult to evaluate the hoax hypothesis. I mean, you can always say it must have been a hoax and just assert that without any evidence, in which case it becomes your explanation for everything. Um, and many skeptics try to declare something debunked without any actual evidence of fraud. But most people aren't lying most of the time. And so for me to endorse the hoax hypothesis, I want to see some kind of evidence of fraud, which I do sometimes discover, as we've seen in previous episodes, where I named people I believe to be frauds, like UFO abductee Terry Loveless in episode 86 on the Devil's Den UFO encounter, Canadian visionary Michelle Rodrigue in episode 123, UFO contactee Stephen Greer in episode 194, and psychic medium Robert Riggi in episode 216, among others. In each of these cases, I did find evidence of fraud. And on our next feedback, Cristobal Gomez Gutierrez on YouTube writes, Hi, Jimmy. Hi, Dom. I think there is a faith perspective similar situation that you could cover as feedback. The Eucharist. Correct me if I'm wrong on my belief. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and or the Last Supper is not repeated in Mass, but we face an actualization of that moment. Hence, it is a time slip. That is proof that the phenomenon exists. Moreover, deepening into this mystery of faith, which doesn't necessarily mean impossible to understand, can help to solve one part of this episode mystery, the time slip itself. To be solved is how can someone perceive it? What do you think? Well, despite what you hear some people say, the church doesn't actually understand the Eucharist as involving a time slip. In Pope Paul VI's 1968 Credo of the People of God, the church professes the belief that the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ now enthroned gloriously in heaven. So it's it, the Eucharist is making Christ's flesh and blood that are in heaven now present on the altar. So it's it's simultaneous. It's not a time slip to the past. Um, you could pr thus propose that the Eucharist involves a space warp, you know, making something that's present elsewhere also present here. But the church doesn't actually understand it as involving a time warp. 
Daniel Fernandez writes on YouTube, I suggest the simplest explanation, a hoax. The ladies believe they could make money off of a book, and it seems likely they did, and explains why they went on that trip together. I'm sure they kept all the records to prove the trip was real. The explanation of a job interview is believable only with difficulty. The written record of letters left behind was carefully crafted. Follow the money if possible. Did they get paid for the follow-up research, perhaps by their publisher? Or perhaps their further research was simply a reinvestment to bolster book sales. Well, unfortunately, I don't have access to their financial records, though they might be available among their papers at Oxford. However, the job interview explanation appears to be solid because it was witnessed by other people at Oxford, not the two of them. I mean, when they made the plan, other people were aware of why they were doing it. And they apparently did not know that the letters that they wrote between the two of them privately would eventually become public, and those private letters do attest to their belief in the experience. James William writes on YouTube, a rare clear-cut one for me. This was just imagination, and it was stirred up even more as they discussed it between themselves. It's a romantic place, and it's easy to see how it could have happened to the ladies. Yeah, so I'm I, something I considered at the time was, could this be a case of imagination? A challenge for the imagination hypothesis would be how they were able to accurately remember, or I should say, accurately imagine so many details of what Versailles was had been like in the past. They saw things, uh, reported seeing things that were what Versailles used to look like, but doesn't anymore. Uh, the next feedback comes from Mike Creevy of our very own Secrets of Star Wars podcast. And Mike says, I loved that Versailles time slip episode. It got me thinking, I'm not sure if this would be potentially time slip or not, but have you or Jimmy ever heard the theory that there was some kind of trans-temporal phenomenon going on when Jesus appeared with Moses and Elijah in the Transfiguration? I've heard some speculation that they were perhaps encountering him across time in their own mountaintop encounters mentioned in the Old Testament. Interesting idea, and I just wanted to see what you guys thought or have heard. I've heard people speculate that, but I would be skeptical. Um, ancient peoples, including the Israelites, didn't seem to have the idea of time travel, but they did have the idea of visions and of people descending from heaven. So it seems to me that it's more. This is more likely to be understood as just a straightforward vision or physical appearance from heaven. And that's how it would have been understood. And that's what was trying to be communicated to the disciples who were allowed to witness it. Um, so I, I would presume that that's the, lo the logical explanation rather than some kind of transtemporal thing. Now we move to feedback from our episode 245, starts with a bang on the theory of the Big Bang. First one comes from Jim Burke on Facebook, who says, they say people now are taller slash bigger than they were long ago. I wonder how much of that is from an ever-expanding space-time fabric. It appears to be due to genetics and nutrition, not the expansion of space-time. The amount of expansion is actually quite small on the local scale in order to have a, a notable expansion of the universe. I mean, they measure it in like thousands of light years, and it only expands a little bit. Um, also, it doesn't affect the distance between molecules. What controls the distance between molecules is the electromagnetic forces that bind them together. And so if you have a bound system, like a, the set of molecules in the human body, the expansion of space does not increase the distance between the molecules, the, the electromagnetic forces keep them at the same distance that they were previously at. Even if space is expanding, these molecules are still at the same set distances. Same thing goes with planets and gravitationally bound systems that are bound together by gravity. Even if space is expanding, the gravity that's binding a system is keeping that system at the same size. So as Woody Allen's mom tells him in the movie Annie Hall, you're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> And then Alex Wilhelm Peter Gansman on Facebook writes, when can we expect a follow up episode? That caution not to equate the Big Bang with Genesis was such a cliffhanger. 
I'm not sure when the next Big Bang episode will release. I haven't written the script for it yet. But to give you a reason to be careful about too closely linking Genesis with the Big Bang, note what Genesis says about the state of the world before the creation of light on day one. It indicates that the world was already there, that it was formless and empty, that it was dark, and that it was covered in water. None of those things describe the state of the universe before the Big Bang, so don't equate the moment of the creation of light in Genesis with the Big Bang, or with the moment about 300,000 years after the Big Bang when the universe was dense enough, its density had lowered to the point that atoms could form and thus allow light to turn on and freely flow through space. We'll have uh, also a link to an article I wrote 10 years ago on why we should be cautious using the Big Bang argument when talking about Genesis. John RTB writes on YouTube, I haven't quite got the idea of the expanding fabric of space. What is space in the first place? What makes space space? How do you define the border of subsisting space, i.e. that separates the universe from the non-existence outside of it, as the universe was expanding from smaller than an atom to a larger and larger dimension? If space is not actually space as we imagine a room or a volume inside a sphere, but a state or space where the laws of nature can exist and subsist and everything else that is in it and defines it, what makes the laws of nature stop existing in order to define the universe's border? And what makes the laws of nature subsist as they are as space as a natural explanation? Can the laws of nature fade away at the border into non-existence or into a different state of space that doesn't sustain the universe as we know it? If everything began as a single entity of existence from absolute nothing or non-existence, even the laws of nature had a definite beginning and must come before the governed state of existence, that is, mass, energy, etc. Since everything came together from a single point of origin, the idea that existence can figure out a balanced state of dynamic existence is the best possible way in order to exist and subsist is amazing, or perhaps impossible. If we discount a higher governing state of existence that pre-existed, pre-existed a whole existence. <laughs> so the nature of space is debated in scientific circles. Some speculate that space may be a phenomenon that emerges from something even more fundamental. We also don't know whether the universe has a boundary or not. Many scientists believe that it doesn't have a boundary, that it's either infinite in extent or that it's wrapped around itself in some way, kind of like the surface of a ball that doesn't have a boundary. Um, so you could walk along the surface of a ball and you won't ever fall off an edge. However, for uh, practical purposes, we can consider space the medium in which physical objects exist. And the expansion of space means that the physical medium containing objects is growing larger, and that carries the galaxies further apart over time. Red Pill on Twitter writes, A subject that interests me a lot is merging evolution. The Big Bang Theory... Sorry, <laughs> the, the, the capitalization threw me. So let me start that sentence again. Mm -hmm. A subject that interests me a lot is merging evolution, the Big Bang Theory, and the story of Adam and Eve from a Christian perspective. No, oh, I see. Well, yeah, Red Pill has <laughs> left out the Oxford comma. <laughs> which I'm, I'm a big fan of the Oxford comma. It clears up so much <laughs> that could otherwise be confusing. Like, exactly. It, there's a difference between mentioning three people and saying, I would like to thank my parents, Lois Lane, and God. <laughs> you know, and if you get the commas in there, that's much more intelligible than if you say, I'd like to thank my parents, Lois Lane, and God. <laughs> so uh, to continue, mm -hmm. yeah. knowing, knowing Jimmy, he's giving me news perspective on the whole thing after this episode. I'm very curious. Thanks in advance, Jimmy. Thanks. Uh, and if you haven't already heard them, you may wish to check out episodes 119, 120, and 121 on the Young Earth Hypothesis, and also episodes 175 and 176 on the Great Flood. They both deal with how Genesis may be understood in light of present scientific ideas, and will continue to have future episodes relating Genesis to modern scientific ideas and seeing how they can square. Joe S. sends in an email. Hi, Jimmy and Dom. 
Thank you for your show slash podcast. Regarding episode 245, starts with a bang. From the photographs of the scientists and physicists, it seems that being a pipe smoker is a requirement to be one. The view over your right shoulder explains why you know so much about many things. <laughs> a number of people commented on how many of the scientists in the video of the episode were pipe smokers, because I just ran across all these photographs of them smoking. Um, and uh, yeah, it was is it, it, it has been common in scientific circles. And I was raised in an academic family with pipe smokers. And yeah, I'm a pipe smoker, too. Yeah, I have to say, yeah, smoking a pipe sometimes helps you think, doesn't it? You know, just that act of holding it and puffing and there's really? something connection to the brain. Uh huh. <laughs> so uh, John Soldati writes via email. Hi, Jimmy. Love the show. First time writing in. I had two questions. Since the fabric of space and time are accelerating away from us, does this mean we experience time differently? Let's say we are currently 10 light years away from a person living in another distant galaxy. I assume would we would be further than 10 light years away after one of our years passes, unless light also expands with the expansion of the universe. Would our counterpart only be one year older like us, or does time speed up sort of like it does for the inhabitants of Narnia in C.S. Lewis's classic children's stories? Also, you use the analogy of a balloon. When the balloon is inflated, things in the balloon move apart. But they also seem to get bigger. As the universe expands, do we get bigger too? But we don't notice it because we stay the same size relative to everything else? So the dynamics of how space and time distort with acceleration and with gravity are complex. And it depends on the frame of reference that you choose to take your measurements from. Uh, however, it seems to me that there would be time dilation effects, meaning that time would appear to progress at different rates on truly cosmic scales. You know, like some galaxies are so far away from us that just by the expansion of the universe, they seem to be moving at near the speed of light. And so I assume time dilation effects would kick in in those galaxies um, from our earthbound perspective. But it's going to change <clears throat> If you're on one of those distant galaxies, because then it looks like the Milky Way is moving away from you at near the speed of light. And so there's going to be there's there. I haven't personally worked out what would happen in those situations, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's some kind of time dilation happening. However, a planet that's 10 light years away would actually be part of the Milky Way. 10 light years is not very far away. <clears throat> The closest star to us is Proxima Centauri, and it's like 4.3 light years away. So 10 light years is, is not that far away. And it would be any such star would therefore be bound gravitationally to the same system that we are, to the Milky Way. It thus wouldn't be moving farther away from us due to the expansion of the universe. The gravity of the stars in the Milky Way are keeping them all together. Um, However, if you're talking about galaxies hundreds of millions or billions of light years away, then I, I could see the expansion of the accelerating expansion of the universe making time seem to run at different rates. When thinking about the balloon analogy, don't think about galaxies as if they're painted or inked onto the surface of the balloon, because if you blow up a balloon, then something painted or inked on its surface will expand. That's not what's happening in this case. Instead, think of the galaxies like little circular pieces of paper that you have glued to the balloon surface. When you inflate the balloon, the little pieces of paper all stay the same size. They're their they're own thing. They're just attached to the balloon. And so the balloon expands, the space between the little pieces of paper gets bigger, but the little pieces of paper don't expand. They stay the same size they were before you inflated it. So no, we don't expand, but the fabric of space between systems, between the gravitationally bound galaxies, that space does expand. Paul Haydock writes via email, for some reason, this episode answered many questions for me and at the same time opened up a number of provoking thoughts about the creation of the universe. It's probably my favorite episode so far of the ones I've listened to. It was very well organized, pulling together centuries of information with intimate details on many of the players, such as Hubble, Father George Lemaitre, and Albert Einstein in an almost suspenseful documentary 
That was amazingly understandable. Thank you for the episode. The standing question I have, or maybe phrased as a perspective here, is if God is outside of time and the universe is dated 13 billion years or so, then the realm of heaven must be beyond the universe. I've always imagined that heaven was held somewhere within the universe. So the standard understanding among theologians has been that heaven is outside of the universe that we see around us. In older times, people pictured God and the angels and saints as living in what they called the Empyrean heaven that was beyond the sphere containing the fixed stars. So that was the older view. Today, the view would be more that God and the angels and saints simply do not have a physical location that we can map onto our universe. So they're not part of our universe. They're not a given number of light years away. They just don't have a physically mappable location inside of our universe. So um, that's how theologians today would would envision it. By the way, I just realized we had a, uh, I try to mention things for the benefit of our audio listeners who aren't seeing the video. And earlier we had one of the uh, listeners refer to the view over my right shoulder. And I should explain what that is for audio listeners. There's a bookcase behind me over my right shoulder. And on one of the shelves of the bookcase, I have part of my pipe collection. So that's what that's referring to. Nice. Over my shoulder, people can see my Legos. Yeah. <laughs> I have a Lego Saturn V that's lit up uh, up there. Mm-hmm. So I'm very proud of it. Uh, all right. Our feedback now comes from episodes 246 and 247 on dowsing. Paul Vidmar wrote on Patreon, I enjoyed the recent dowsing episode. When I was an intern for a water company, I had guys that were water main locators that showed me the use of witching sticks. You use two copper rods shaped like an L, hold the short leg with the long legs pointed straight out. When you walk over the water main, they will turn out towards each other. The folks that were good could even determine the depth, which I'm proud to say I did successfully a few times. I could even find gas mains and electrical lines. Good to know it's not part of the occult. Now, is there a way to unconfess a mortal sin? Thanks, guys. Oh, congratulations on your dowsing success. Uh, While you didn't need to confess this, if you believed at the time that you had knowingly and deliberately sinned, well, you would need to confess that because you violated your conscience. But you don't need to unconfess anything now, and there's really no way to do that. Then from our uh, coordinator, our feedback coordinator, Rob Leonardi, he writes, uh, what would be the difference between dowsing and scrying? I realize there are differences in the term scrying, so I'd appreciate both the explanation of regular scrying as well as, in particular, the type of scrying used in the old Charmed TV show when they used a crystal over a map to pinpoint someone's location. I would suspect the latter might be for the same as dowsing. Furthermore, I recently saw that there is something which is advertised to work exactly like a Ouija board, but specifically to have a seance to talk with the Holy Spirit, which leads to the question of, is it okay to come up with Christian tarot cards or Ouija boards, as long as we're specifically not calling upon spirits and rather trying to use a natural human ability or calling upon Jesus's name. So I haven't seen the show Charmed, so I don't know what kind of scrying they did on it. However, what you describe sounds like it may have been a form of map dowsing, only substituting the perception of an image in the crystal for the mo- substituting perceiving an image in a crystal for the motion of an object like a dowsing rod. But you're right that the word scrying gets used a bunch of different ways. It's commonly used to refer to looking at an object or substance of some sort in hopes of seeing images that or shapes that contain information. Famous examples include looking into a mirror or gazing into a crystal ball. And we may discuss scrying more in a future episode. When it comes to the Ouija board to contact God thing that's being sold, I have seen advertisements for it uh, and articles strongly denouncing it. Um, This would not be scrying since you're not looking for a subjectively perceived image, but for the objectively visible motion of the device's planchette. Like any other Ouija board, you're going to slide, be sliding the planchette around to different letters and it'll spell messages and everybody looking at it can see 
you know, what letter the planchette is pointing at. So this is an objective motion that you're looking for, not a subjective, oh, I see a shape in this that has some kind of meaning in this, in the shadows in this crystal. Um, as I've said before, there is nothing intrinsically magical or spiritual about a board with letters on it. Um, I mean, they use them to teach kids to read. So there's nothing really significant about a board with letters on it in and of itself. So we shouldn't be superstitious as if the physical object of a board with letters was somehow evil. And trying to contact God is certainly less morally objectionable than other possible uses of such a board. Um, however, First John tells us not to believe every spirit, but to test the spirit. So you wouldn't want to assume that it's God you're talking to just because that's who you asked for. It could be a deceptive spirit. And it might be that you're not talking to any spirit at all. The idiomotor effect is the most likely explanation for most of the behavior of a Ouija board. The idiomotor effect is little subconscious motions of the muscles, such as in your hands, that uh, you're not even aware you're sending. And it's the, it, it is involved in phenomena like table tipping and, uh, and pendulum use and dowsing rods and, and Ouija boards. Um, in these cases, people are in physical contact with an object and they are moving it in a subconscious way. But that doesn't mean, and now in some cases, you might have a psychic function like dowsing that you're using to the the dowsing rods to externalize so that you can pick up on what is this psychic sense telling you but it also can just be your own subconscious so um you may not be if you're using a, a ouija board you may not be talking to any spirit at all the messages being generated by it are in many cases most likely just being generated naturally by your own subconscious so um so all the more reason to be skeptical and use critical thinking in these areas and not just leap to it's always demons or it's always God. It may just be your subconscious. And uh, we'll also have a link to information on Wikipedia about scrying, but because it's Wikipedia and it deals with a paranormal subject, the link will have a hostile skeptical bias, but at least there may be some facts there that will be of use. Jesse Holthouse on Facebook writes, I finally got around to watching this one. My uncle used dowsing to find water on his farm. It got me thinking, have you ever done an episode on the validity of the farmer's almanac? Some people swear by it. We mentioned the farmer's almanac in our two-part look at Nostradamus, episode 153 and also episode 154, because Nostradamus published almanacs. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't done an episode specifically evaluating the Farmer's Almanac. I'm not sure if there's enough of a mystery there to do an episode, but I'll think about it. April Blake writes on YouTube, I'm going to guess that in the faith and reason perspective, you have concluded that it's okay and not dangerous to use a pendulum. Otherwise, you would not have demonstrated its use at the beginning of the episode. I don't think you would find it surprising to reach that conclusion, though, or even to reach the opposite conclusion. There must be something more specific you found out about dowsing in church teaching or maybe church history. We know that the apostles cast lots to discern who would replace Judas, and we know the Old Testament story of the fleece being set out to obtain a sign. Neither of these things would be surprising to you either, so it must be more than that. I will be very interested in watching the follow-up. It's a particularly interesting topic to me because before I returned to the ch church in 2009, I had many years of pagan practices that I threw out when I returned to the church. I did use a pendulum along with tarot when I worked for a psychic line from about 1996 to 1998 or early 1999. I still did tarot and other types of reading occasionally after that, just not professionally. I threw it all out along with astrology books, witchcraft books, and a large collection of other things. I've wondered if the pe pendulum is okay for the reason that it is access of the subconscious and not invoking some deity. I've even wondered about using a rosary in place of a pendulum. Would that be sacrilegious? 
So in the episodes on dowsing, when I, what I was demonstrating using a pendulum was the idiomotor effect. I wasn't trying to do anything psychic. I was just demonstrating how the idiomotor effect works, which is purely natural. So I would, I was holding a pendulum and without consciously moving my hand, I can make it swing side to side or forward and back or go clockwise or counterclockwise or stop. And I specifically was not trying to, I wasn't asking God or a spirit or anything or to, to do this. It's, it was just my, the subconscious motions of my hand informed by my conscious desire to have it swing a certain way. So I, I wasn't doing anything psychic. Uh, I was doing something purely natural. And pendulums are just tools, like boards with letters on them or boards without letters on them or letters that aren't on boards. Um, it's all just tools. And the question is, what are you doing with the tool? Uh, we shouldn't be superstitious about pendulums or like we shouldn't be uh, superstitious about other physical objects. Pendulums are just physical objects and they have legitimate uses. They're used, for example, in clocks and in navigational equipment, not perfectly natural, non-paranormal use of pendulums. In part two of the story, I did discuss uh, dowsing from the faith perspective, and we saw that the church has been very open to the idea of dowsing as a natural human ability, including being okay with doing scientific research on dowsing. So the church has not judged the psychic use of a pendulum for dowsing to be problematic. When it comes to using, a, not, but that's not what I was doing when I demonstrated it. Um, when it comes to using a rosary as a pendulum, um, I wouldn't see that as intrinsically sacrilegious. If you were doing so and asking for Mary's guidance and protection, it would be placing your activity under her mantle. That doesn't mean that there wouldn't be any risks, but it would be essentially the same thing as, you know, wearing a medal of the Virgin Mary or another saint and asking for their guidance and protection as you go about your business. Candy Clues on YouTube writes, 90% of the world's supply of fresh water lies underground. I had an Australian uncle who had a huge farm. He was so skilled at finding water for his animals that he doused over a map of his land. He called it distant dow distance dowsing. He told me dowsing, for water in his case, was both a physical and a psychological phenomenon tapping into energy fields. Like all crafts, it takes practice, practice, and practice. So water dowsing may involve sensing energy fields, um, but that wouldn't explain all forms of dowsing. Uh, because if you have success in dowsing when you're looking for a lost object or a lost person, they're not going to emit different energy fields than they normally do just because people don't know where the object or the person is. Um, it thus would seem that in some cases there would need to be a psychic process going on that doesn't involve energy fields. But in other cases, like looking for water, well, water does have electromagnetic properties and hypothetically you might be able to sense it uh, through a physical energy field, even though we don't have evidence that that's what's happening. Thomas Fleming writes on YouTube, when I worked for the utility company, from time to time, we'd be concerned about the location of a water line before we would dig. There were guys who could take two short pieces of copper wire used to set up grounding on the poles for service. They'd put the ends of the bent wires in a couple of drink bottles to allow the wires to move freely without being interfered with by gripping the wires in each hand. We could hold the bottles in each hand over the area and watch for the wires to turn, indicating that the water line was under us. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. Jen Doe writes on YouTube, it's pretty interesting to hearing that the church doesn't immediately find stuff like this inherently demonic. Part of my family are farmers and country folks, so there's little things and signs they read and gauge what's going to happen. My favorite is the idea of throwing a dead snake over a fence line, and if it lasts three days on there, it will rain. God created the world and all of creation, and we are barely beginning to scratch the surface of every mystery. It wouldn't surprise me if things like dowsing become more well-known and understood like electricity. Strange things happen more than people think. I hadn't heard of the dead snake rain trick. Um, personally, I'd be rather skeptical of that one, but we do live in a very mysterious world. Then uh, Mir Solace on YouTube writes, 
Isn't there a technique with L rods where the handle part of the rod is enclosed in a tube so that it rotates freely within the tube? Doesn't the use of such rods eliminate the possibility that the idiomotor effect is at work since any hand motion only affects the exterior cylinder, not the rods? Well, there is such a procedure uh, for L rods and Thomas Fleming described people using copper L rods put in drink bottles to achieve the same effect, but it doesn't eliminate the idiomotor effect. Uh, subconsciously tipping and vibrating the bottles in your hand will cause the L rods to move. So the idiomotor effect is still there. Um, using sleeves for the handles of the L rods or putting them in drink bottles as sleeves, it makes it easier for them to swing freely. So it makes it easier for them to move. And that also um, makes them more susceptible to the idiomotor subconscious movements of the hands on the sleeves or the bottles. Ethel Hart on YouTube writes, regarding the prohibition on priests dowsing to find missing people, another reason I could see a prohibition on dowsing to find missing people is the potential scandal and suspicion it may incur on the priest. Imagine a priest dowses to find a missing person and he succeeds to find the target dead. For someone who's skeptical of dowsing, they could say that he was able to find the body not by dowsing, but because he put it there. That is one risk that uh, would exist in these situations. John uh, writes on YouTube, if you go to the Wikipedia page, it lists numerous studies that were done, and with the exception of maybe one or two, they are overwhelmingly negative or, uh, on dowsing as a real phenomenon. I wish Jimmy would have gone into them more instead of relying on Dr. Smith. So the problem with Wikipedia is that it has a pronounced skeptical bias on its uh, paranormal related pages. Um, there's, you know, there are because anybody can edit it. Uh, some people become entrenched editors and will push their viewpoint. And this has happened with uh, people from the skeptical community who are who are closed minded. Uh, so I'm not talking about the good kind of skepticism, the open minded kind. I mean, the closed minded skepticism of people who will dismiss any unusual phenomena, including religious ones. Um, those people have taken over the Wikipedia pages that deal with these subjects, and they will not allow people to post contrary evidence. They'll, they'll edit it out. Um, that's why the British Society for Psychical Research set up an online resource called the Psy Encyclopedia, which is much more open-minded and balanced and is a peer-reviewed academic source. So not everybody can edit it, but the experts who, are, who peer review each other's articles can, unlike Wikipedia. I wanted to talk to Paul about dowsing, both because he's a dowser and a dowsing instructor, but also because he co-authored a chapter involving dowsing in an academic textbook of parapsychology. It's Edsel Cardena's uh, textbook, Par Parapsychology, a handbook for the 21st century. And the chapter discusses the different studies that have been done. And in the episode, Paul indicated that there are studies pointing both ways. I agree that we could have gone into more detail about them, but, you know, you can't always bring out everything you'd like to discuss. And the episode was already running along. If you're interested, though, we'll have some links for you, including a link to the Sci Encyclopedia's article about dowsing, which is much better than the one Wikipedia has, and also Etzel Cardina's book that Paul contributed to, if you'd like to get a copy of this academic textbook. Uh, Doss Shield on YouTube writes, interesting way you mix the in the usual mysterious world writing and mention of references with the interview format. I'm glad Dr. Paul Smith was content with participating in this format because it resulted in a well-produced revelation and conversation. Good work, Jimmy Dom and team. Thanks. I continue to experiment with ways to integrate the usual segments of the show, like the faith and reason perspectives, with interviews. And I also thought this was a successful blend of the formats. Very good. And that is all of our feedback for this time. Uh, you, too, can send in your mysterious feedback on any of the topics we cover. You can do so by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, 
or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And also, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I had a couple things I wanted to mention. So first one, if you want to contact me about anything related to Mysterious World, use the address that Dom just gave, feedback at mysterious.fm. I have other email addresses out there on the web, but they're for other things. And it gums up my internal email process management. If I get Mysterious World related emails at non-Mysterious World addresses. So use feedback at mysterious.fm. I will see it. It will get to me. That's the one to use if it's at all connected with Mysterious World. And thank you. Also, um, you know, we mentioned that uh, we have both audio listeners and video viewers for the podcast. Um, I would encourage you, if you're a listener of the audio version, to check out the video version of the show. You can do that by going to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And I uh, would appreciate it while you're there if you hit uh, like on videos that you like, because that will tell the YouTube algorithm that you liked it and therefore other people might like it too, and it'll show it to more people. And so you can help grow the audience by hitting like. Also, um, you can, I'd appreciate it if you would hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so that you always get a notification whenever I have a new video out, whether it's for Mysterious World or something else. Um, I am trying to grow the channel, and so I'd really appreciate it. And thank you in advance. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 262A. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>